helping with the same. It's just you can't do it without perfection. Okay. Could I have your attention, please? My name is Rick Gross, and I'm the president of the Center City Residents Association. And my colleague down there, Dennis Boylan, I'm the president of the Logan Square Neighborhood Association. And on behalf of both Rick and myself, this is a great event for both boards of the two neighbor, adjoining neighborhood associations to get together because we're here for a very serious topic. And so we appreciate you coming out tonight. And with that, Rick, I will toss it back to you. We have um, some wonderful guests here tonight and half of the Philadelphia Police Department has come to join us. <laughs> I hope there's somebody watching the streets. <laughs> Many, many people are joined in this meeting by Zoom, and the meeting is being recorded. And it will be, this part of the meeting, which we expect to go an hour, will be available on the CCRA website tomorrow and the Logan Square website as well for all of you who are on Zoom or who can't make it. We will ask any questions from Zoom people to go into chat, and our managing director, Travis Oliver, will get a chance to pose those questions um, during the course of the event. The way this is organized before I introduce our, our honored guests is that there will be a PowerPoint from the department. And then we have circulated a list of five topics that members expressed a lot of interest in. And we will, Dennis and I will alternate chairing those topics, getting answers, asking, getting questions from the board, getting questions from the Zoom, and then moving on. We are hopeful that this whole thing can be done in an hour. Um, and we are, with that, I'm going to introduce um, our wonderful commissioner, Commissioner Outlaw, who is uh, uh, the face of the police in Philadelphia, and our new captain, Captain Billups, for District 5. Um, and with that, I'll let you introduce everyone. Else. All right, so good evening, everyone. Before I get started into our slide, deck, is, is there a mic somewhere? Do I have to stand in a certain way? Or? Okay, but I'm good if I stand here, yeah. the folks here can hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to briefly turn it over to Chief Inspector Jim Kelly, who will introduce the team here, our captains, um, inspector who is behind a lot of what. Uh, I'll be presenting tonight, and then I'll go right into the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good evening, everyone. We're glad to be here. It's a nice meeting. And, you know, we haven't had a whole lot of in-person meetings, so it's nice to have one. So I'm Chief Inspector Kelly. I command Rock South, which is primarily half the city. Central Division, which is the division you live in, Southwest, and South Division. I have tonight with me, I have the captain of the 6th District, which is east of Broad Street. I have Captain X John Craig, one of our new captains. Captain Joe Ruff, he's one of our new captains. He has Center City District, which kind of overlaps both the 6th and the 9th. He has foot beats, he has bikes. And he does a little bit of both on both sides. And then I have another new captain who's done a really good job already. And that's Captain Colleen Phillips. And down on the end is Captain Ray Evers, who commands Central Division, and who put the. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Inspector Ray Evers. Yeah. <laughs> he's the commander of Central Division. He's done a great job. In fact, he's really the architect of a lot of the things that you're seeing in Center City right now, and some hopefully some of the improvements you're seeing. That's pretty much the team. Everybody that's here was uh, very, very uh, sought after. All three of these new captains, they were on my request list. So they all come highly recommended with good backgrounds and they're very bright. And I think they're gonna do really good things to Center City. Thank you. Thank you. I neglected to introduce a couple of guests. We have Jane Green, who's the president of the Center City Coalition of which CCRA is a member and represents many of the buildings and um, uh, offices and others throughout the center city. And is Eleanor here? Yeah, Eleanor Ingersoll is the president of the Queen Village Neighbors Association. Uh, I'll explain later why Eleanor is here. And we also have Harriet Williams, who represents the Philadelphia, which is just on the other side of our boundary, outside of, uh, up by the Art Museum. 
So welcome. It's your show. All right. Can you hear me if I have this mask on? Yes. yes. It only takes one person to say, oh, look, Commissioner Outlaw was out in the public and then took a picture and she didn't have her mask on. So, exactly, right? So, if we can get the first slide. Uh, is, okay. So, I'm going to look over here so I'm not looking up this slide. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So, I share, I'm share. i sharing a PowerPoint presentation that we initially put together for chamber and this was an initiative an initiative that i'm walking towards inspector evers we asked the inspector along with his team prior to the holidays to come up with a resource deployment plan as major employers here in the city were preparing for employees to return back to work in addition to that we knew the holidays were coming up and initially we were just kind of planning like a grown up back to school initiative or you know or an effort but there was an expressed interest in extending the deployment through the holidays i think for obvious reasons and uh, we've seen some really good returns uh, on the plan the purpose of this first slide that's up is to make very clear if we're dealing with an issue around an increase in carjackings, for example, or during the summer it was ATV dirt bikes, right? We deployed our strategies utilizing the existing police resources that we already have. Unfortunately, we don't have cadres or reserves of officers kind of waiting in the corner, waiting to be put in, right? So I keep crediting Ray over here because he was very thoughtful in utilizing the pre-existing center city district resources, the sixth district, ninth district, all of those resources, in addition to our regional partners to make sure that not only we were um, being as efficient with the resources that we already have, but to make sure that we were centralized, we were communicating um, and that everybody stepped up in their areas of responsibility. Next slide, please. This next slide talks about the partners who were included in this plan. As you know, there's a lot of overlap, right? So even when you go outside, there's SEPTA hubs, uh, there's hospitals, there's universities, there's private securities. There's so many different stakeholders that have some form of involvement or responsibility in keeping the areas that we're talking about tonight very safe. So again, these are the list of the partners that um, the inspector and his team went hand in hand, full throttle and said, okay, look, well, here's what the data is telling us. When are you expecting folks to return to work? What are the major thoroughfares or uh, the hubs or the areas where we're seeing uh, the most problems? Where do we need to ensure safe passage? So on and so forth. And these are the folks uh, that have been at the table. Next slide, please. The initial strategy, uh, again, included the 6th, the 9th district and city center districts. And the original um, priority or prioritized areas were, or the boundaries, I would say, were from 8th to 20th streets and then from Locust to JFK. That's where we were initially. Um, and this was based off of, again, input that we received and then just trying to be as realistic as possible with making sure that we have we had the resources to ensure visibility. Next slide, please. The original strategy also um, called for increased visibility. We wanted to make sure that we had marked police vehicles, not just from our department, but from SEPTA, the Port Authority, the Sheriff's Office, um you name it in these hubs where there was visibility and sometimes there might not be someone sitting in the car but we know when there is a marked police car somewhere it automatically makes the majority of us feel safe we also utilized our uh, motorcycles mounted patrol um, we utilized foot beats meaning more officers on foot bicycles and then we also coordinated with private security um, that last bullet point that you see there talks about how we incorporated 20 civilian security bikes. So those are non-police uh, security 
that were funded by the Center City District, uh, and they were added to complement the existing bike deployment. Next slide, please. We saw some early successes. Um, at the end of last year's No Secret, we know that we saw an uptick in our violent crime, specifically as it relates to our non-fatal um, non shootings and our homicides, but um, we utilize these tactical resources that we deployed out there to address an uptick of robberies. Specifically, some of you may remember around the holidays, uh, around the Rittenhouse area, uh, around the Four Seasons, there were individuals over a short period of time that were being uh, targeted. And what we were able to quickly find out, they were being targeted because of the Rolex watches that we were wearing. Because of this coordinated effort, um, you know, that the inspector put together, we were not only able to just identify who we thought were involved almost, I don't want to say almost immediately, but fairly quickly, we were able to make some very key and very quick and timely arrests. And by doing so and making those arrests, that robbery pattern immediately ceased. So that tells us that not only, I mean, obviously we can't get ahead of everything, but because we had people in the areas and able to respond and we had our partners working with us. And again, um, I emphasize our partnerships with local, state, federal uh, partners and law enforcement because we had all of these resources available and assigned to this area, we were able to make this key arrest and immediately stop that pattern. That robbery pattern decreased and uh, in 2021, in the 6th district, we saw that our commercial burglaries decreased 21% compared to the previous year. And then in the ninth district, when you compare 2021 to the previous year, we saw a decrease of 40% in our commercial burglaries. I say that because we know that depending on where we are in the city, it might be different needs. We might not be talking about uh, shootings and homicides here, right? We might be talking about the need to walk from this corner to this corner safely after I go shopping. We might be talking about commercial burglaries. We might be talking about just the ability to walk on a sidewalk without stepping around people or aggressive panhandling. So we recognize that we have to tailor whatever our strategies are to the needs of our specific community. And that's what this plan did. Can we go to the next slide, please? I'm sorry, I'm already flipping pages and then, <laughs> like, where are we at? Okay. We got it. <laughs> so can I just share a secret really quick? I was so happy that I finally jumped into the realm of purchasing a pair of readers. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, wow, these are like little mini, it's like heaven on earth. I have personalized magnifying glass, but the last for each eyeball. And of course I left. <laughs> in front of you and it's just you know i'm getting out of denial so continued enforcement effort in 2022 we saw some early successes but we also recognized that we wanted to bolster our efforts we recognized that okay this isn't something that we're just thinking about doing through the holidays or as we anticipate the return for people to return to work how do we sustain this and what are some things that we still need to continue to do in the short term as was discussed by the chief inspector, we had three um, new captains transferred here. I will tell you, um, these were very intentional moves. And as much as I try not to go super down in the weeds and allow uh, our chiefs to run their shops, I want to know very clearly that we are putting people in the right seats. We are putting them in assignments that complement their skill sets. And um, you got it right here. You got, you absolutely have it right here. Captains Craig Phillips and Rub, uh, you have individuals here that um, not only take the vision of the department or of myself or the action plan that we rolled out in 2022, but they're innovative and they are open to working not only with you, but recognizing that we can't do these jobs without you and we need your input and your collaboration in order to be successful. 
So I say that not just to kind of blow smoke, but I say that to, to make it very clear, we are very intentional in everything that we're sharing with you tonight. Um, we strengthen our patrols by reassigning administrative personnel. And then also beginning on the 7th, we reestablished our presence by adding eight additional footbeat patrols from the city center district through a partnership with uh, the CCD president, Paul Levy. Two of those would be patrols will be dedicated to the Chinatown area. So we've now extended to the Chinatown area as well. Next slide, please. We're bolstering um, our efforts with four tactics. We just put in four buckets, right? As I talked about uh, visibility being very, very important, we're still going to continue to focus on increasing our visibility. I just mentioned how we have increased our foot beat patrols, but we're also establishing micro grids, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in a second. And then sidewalk focus, more focus on how we can ensure safe passages on the sidewalks here. And we keep putting those asterisks there because we want you to know that we're still utilizing the same resources, uh, but continuing to partner with other um, with other stakeholders as force multipliers to ensure that you all are getting the service that you deserve. Next slide, please. Really quickly, when you talk about visibility, we're talking about more visibility in our hotspot areas. What are our most problematic areas? Where do we know if we move a, ve a vehicle or a body, the second we move, something's going to happen, right? So that's what a hotspot would be. Um, how are people feeling? I've had conversations about people saying, I don't feel safe. Whether or not it's something that we can articulate, it's about perception and how we're made to feel. We want to, we want to tap into that as well. Um, engagement of business safety education for best practices, something that's going to be uh, happening and ongoing, and then also enhancing our bike patrols to cover areas of, of concern as well. Next slide. Thank you. We've increased our foot feet patrols. So ensuring that we're all aligned, again, we work with partners. So we're mirroring our deployment with the CCD 2021 uh, year-end pedestrian counts report to make sure that we're putting our officers and in, in other resources in the right locations. Officers will approach and meet business owners to develop a trusted and personal connection. And although this sounds very, um, like, you know, I don't want to be Captain Obvious here. It's not, this next bullet point is like, yeah, duh. But although we are the fourth largest police department in the country, we're still a little bit behind when it comes to the use of technology. We're going to be providing business cards and cell phones to all of these officers that I'm talking about so that they can have the means to communicate both ways, not just one way, but both ways with our business owners and uh, community leaders here. Um, so that there is an opportunity for developing relationships and sustaining those relationships as well. Again, I know that sounds like a, oh, well, yeah, well, it's not something we have, folks. It's not something that we have. And so our footbeat areas have been increased to, again, Chinatown, Old City, and uh, Rittenhouse Square. Next slide. I'm almost done. <laughs> Microgrids. This is important because if you remember those boundaries that I explained in the beginning, 8 to 20 and locus JFK, it's a lot of space in between there. Um, it's important to allow our folks to be successful. So establishing micro gives them gives them a smaller area of responsibility so they can know who their people are, um, have again increased visibility, establish those relationships and not be responsible for such a large amount of space in the area. Um, so we've reconfigured our CCD patrol areas with smaller grids for personal connection and coverage. Um, and the whole point of this is to ensure that those gaps or those areas that aren't currently covered by the 6th and the 9th district get attention as well. Uh, this applies to all remaining CCD personnel similar to what we currently do with Jewelers Row and City Hall. 
And at the what is it, February, so March of 2022, we anticipate the rollout of 12 to 15 micro grids. Next slide, please. Sidewalk focus. That's why I talked about the ability to just kind of walk freely and feel safe. Um, these boundaries will include uh, Locust Street to Ludlow and 20th to Broad Street. And this is uh, an increased focus again on sidewalks, but it consists of PSA officers, service detail officers, and our footbeat officers. Why is it important that I'm sharing this with you? Everything that we're doing is intentional. All of these officers, officers I just mentioned are in assignments where they regularly work um, with people or, or social services or other city agencies. They have, I'm not saying all cops don't, but some, some of us are a little bit more patient than others, right? And so these are the individuals that have all of these soft skills that we want them to have to be able to address um, nuisance complaints or other quality of life issues. So again, very intentional for here. Um, they'll be working with the Office of Homeless Services, uh, CCD, and CLIP for other quality of life issues. We'll be utilizing the traffic unit for better flow through these areas. And then we'll also be placing police cars in the areas that have the most pedestrian density. And an example here that we give you is uh, 1700 block of Walnut and 1700 block of Chestnut. So with that, those are the four initiatives for 2022. Um, that is the plan. If you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer them for you. But I think it's very important for all of you to know that there is a plan. We've seen some early results and hopefully I hope that you're able to say that, yeah, I have seen an increase of cops here uh, in the area. But if there's anything that you think is missing, please feel welcome to share that as well. Thank you for listening and for your attention. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I, we're going to get questions both from the floor and through Zoom, but we have some organized topics and we'll go through them between Dennis and me and all this stuff will come up. The first topic that our members want to talk about is gun violence. We know it's a horrible epidemic throughout the country and particularly in Philadelphia. We, Our neighborhoods are not the locus of them, but increasingly we have reports of shootings um, sometimes fatal within the areas of both Logan and Center City, including um, a disturbing incident last evening. We hear and get lots of calls from residents to say what's happening, the people arrested, what's going on. Um, and we'd like to hear about your initiatives on this. I, I read that um, uh, Reinhardt's office said that if you are involved in a fatal shooting, you have a 60% chance of not being convicted. And in a non-fatal shooting, you have an 80% chance of non-getting -get convicted in that city. Those numbers strike me as a little high. Can you talk to us about gun violence and how we can work with you to minimize its effect on these two neighborhoods? Certainly. I mean, when you say it like that, it sounds terrible. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Earth, Earth. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so to be clear, what, what we're talking about are clearance rates. Our non-fatal shoot, shooting clearance rate has remained very, very low for quite some time. And as the caseloads continue to increase, same thing for our homicide clearance rates as well. Um, there's a lot that goes into actually clearing a case once we make an arrest. For a lot of these cases, we actually know who committed these crimes. We need witnesses to come forward. And then there's other factors once we present the case um, over to the DA's office for prosecution. Um, and then as the case matriculates through the criminal justice system, you know, there's, there's a much larger ecosystem and conversation, I think, that can be had around that. I don't think there's any question around whether or not the PPD believes um, that violent crime is a priority. I think I've made very clear moving forward in this year that this is that there's nothing more important to us, right? There's a lot of things that were laid out in our strategic plan, but crime and addressing crime, nothing more important. So with the resources that we do have, it's all hands on deck as it relates to gun violence. What we know 
is that there's a small percentage of individuals that's responsible for the largest percentage of crime. Same thing with places in, this, in the city. So with the resources that we do have, because we don't, we're about 10% less than the staffing we had in what, 2015, right? So people think, oh, well, on paper, you guys have 6,500 cops. No, we don't. We're at about 5,900. And everybody doesn't work on the street. I've done what I can to ensure that we are pulling from where we can officers out of specialized units and back into uniforms and in cars to help us supplement some of these efforts. We also know that at the end of 2020 and 21, our partnerships with our federal law enforcement agencies were tremendous. Our partnerships uh, in our task force worked with the AG's office, with the Gun Violence Task Force. It yielded some amazing results. I've been pushing for more of that. Uh, unfortunately, um, not unfortunately, fortunately, I have the ability uh, to sit at some pretty big tables. I sit on the board for major city chiefs um, as one of the Eastern representatives. I was fortunate enough to sit in three meetings with policy folks from the White House. And not only did we speak about reform and accountability, but we spoke about crime and what needs to be done. And I made some very clear direct um, requests in asking that our federal resources are, are given additional capacity, meaning more bodies so we can charge more cases federally. That works, folks. When people get federal time, when you talk about deterrence, that works. I know the president recently announced uh, that he was uh, putting more money into the services side of the initiative. I think that's great. There has to be carrot and stick. Can't be more stick than carrot, can't be more carrot than stick. With that said, we're gonna continue to push forward. Again, we're utilizing the resources that we have. We're, we formulated uh, a non-fatal shooting working group. And these detectives are now focused on all non-fatal non -fatal shootings and they're centralized in one place, much like homicide is now. They'll have a dedicated uh, person in the DA's office. They get the same technology, um, so on and so forth to put the same attention into non-fatal shootings that we do homicides and to hopefully bolster that number. So there's a lot of work being done. I'm talking with other federal uh, or actually partner agencies to see if we can get them to come into the city as well and help us with patrol. If you got state jurisdiction to be the police, you got jurisdiction to be the police in the city of Philadelphia. So again, a lot of work underway a lot of efforts, a lot of key arrests being made. The numbers, I don't want to jinx myself and I don't like throwing out stats because they can change tomorrow. Um, the last couple of weeks, actually four weeks, I would say the numbers have been decreasing. The non-fatal shootings and our homicides have been steadily decreasing. I'm hoping we can continue that trend. So it tells us that what we're doing is working. We just got to do more of it and we need more folks on board with prioritizing what we're doing. We got close to 6,000 illegal crime guns off the street last year. Guns are falling out of the sky. That's a priority for us. We've seen people arrested. We've seen people shot that have had repeated arrests for carrying uh, firearms illegally. Some people have been arrested and or shot while they had an open case. The courts were closed for a year in 2020. So a lot of people with pending cases are out on the street. So again, when I say there's a lot of factors that contribute to what we saw, we are going to continue to do what we know we need to do uh, to make sure we continue to push the ball forward. Let me ask one follow-up on this before the next question. And it's a little bit controversial, but are you able to work with the DA in a manner that gives you guys comfort that your efforts get uh, taken all the way to the end? Or have you had those conversations? I work with anybody professionally. Look, these are lives that are lost. Children are getting killed. Uh, children are becoming shooters, so their lives are lost. I will continue to have an open door. I requested a monthly meeting upon my arrival here. We still do meet once a month. We created a um, two working groups, a quality assurance groups at my request to go back and uh, revisit some of these cases to ensure on PPDs in that these cases will get charged. And if they're not getting charged, tell us why. 
Um, I said this as recently as what well, I don't know what today is Tuesday. So it was yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. It's not too late. There are fundamental differences, but it's not too late. Right. We all can say, all right, well, you know what? I started off this way. So maybe, you know, I can make an adjustment. We all have to do that as leaders and how we prioritize. So it's not about like dislike. I mean, in a lot of areas, it is what it is. I very publicly said what the police department will prioritize. And it's my hope that the rest of our partners will prioritize in the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dennis, question two. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's nothing like taking the question out beforehand. Your presentation addressed a number of things with your initiatives. Uh, this is a quality of life uh, question. Um, and I guess I've, since you've answered a number of things already, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it saying what we see that works is the communication with the, you know, the, with our district, the Knight District. We've got two great community affairs officers, Steve Kiefer and Jesse O'Shea. Uh, a number of us have Jesse's cell phone. We already call him on his cell phone. We pass information to him. He passes it back. It helps at our neighborhood level. So I guess one of the things is put us to work. You've got two large blocks of residents here. We cover a lot of ter territory. We go from Spring Garden to Market. CCRA goes from Market South to of course South South Street. South South Street. Yeah, it's a big chunk of Center City, and we've got a lot of talent here. So put us into the mix. We're happy to, you know, we will gladly participate to help you work more efficiently and better. And we've got, you know, each of our groups have, um, you know, we've got a health and safety committee that works with the, you know, the, uh, uh, on the PDAC committee. But, you know, again, we've got resources. We're on the street. We, we're good eyes and ears for you. Um, so the, the question also is, is, what we've seen in the center city district, when you put the team together with um, the social services, the homeless outreach, the police, it's very effective. But center city district doesn't cover all of, you know, in my area, everything up the parkway. How do we codify this and put it into where you, you know, the districts start to form teams that can go outside of the center city district. You know, it's a specialized group that's got the talent that can go out and address things. Uh, you know, we've got over on Schuylkill River Trail, tents pop up. The I-676 off-ramp right by your headquarters, tents pop up. Um, and we try and address this quickly, but sometimes, you know, we feel like we're chasing our tail. So I guess that, that we're happy to come in with ideas. I've got some good, you know, we've got a lot of good talent. We're happy to give you our sort of what we see working and collaborate. We understand you're the professionals but put us to work. So, I mean, it, it is a willingness and, and you know, we understand this is a serious time in Philadelphia. We've got to get our city, our whole city back to, uh, you know, on its feet. We've got to get center city back on its feet because we need those suburbanites that are sitting home on Zoom to come back and pay some wage tax. Uh, it's that just aren't getting, you know, right now, Morale in the neighborhood is, is, is fairly, you know, is down. It's the quality of life. Uh, one of my board members asked me to escort her here tonight. People don't feel comfortable after the sun goes down. And that's, you know, I've been here 40 years. We have never experienced that. So I guess, I mean, I don't know, you know, it's not really a question as much as it is a statement on, um, you know, over on the Walnut Street Carter, we've got merchants, small businesses that can't survive. They've got, you know, people on their doorstep every morning to step over as they come in. And again, on Logan Square, I've got one guy that's causing a disruption that's that's impacting more College of Art. You know, we've got, you know, you, you focus on specifics. That's the information we need to be able to pass back up and, and, and then work with you collaboratively. So it's not so much a question as it's an offer uh, that we're here to work with you. Uh, Thank community you. policing is this community. Thank you. Yeah. How best do we report what we see? I walk the neighborhood every day. I walk over people. There are some of the same people in some of the same doorways. As soon as the business goes dark, it becomes a homeless residence. I asked realtors how they can show that property and they say it's very tough. Nobody wants to come to an office and have to walk over people who are living in there. How do we help you respond to those kinds of issues? 
Inspector, you want to talk about how you best prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because I don't want to say call the inspector because the inspector has a life too. But I know the inspector is also overly responsive to a fault. So I'm going to sure. see I mean, that over I, I think the things we look at is we'll look at Market Street East as a small microcosm of what's going on in Center City. If folks, maybe last year, within the last 10 years, were on Market Street East, it was getting kind of seedy. And I'm, I'm out of doubt. But what we did is when we worked with our major players on that side, Jefferson and Sept and all those companies. So what can we do to kind of basically clean up Mark Trees? It was it wasn't arrest. We did not lock up one person on Mark Trees in six months when we implement this. And we're talking about street behavior, not like someone does a robbery, of course, those those arrests were made. There was wasn't one person was arrested, but we just kind of changed the tone in reference to street behavior. What is going to be allowed and what is not going to be allowed? There was people selling turtles at the market. That's not allowed. You're not, you're not selling turtles at the market. There are certain things you're not doing at 11th and You're not doing the things that were, I don't want to say accepted, but because of COVID and everything happened. So we're going to use that model of just having visibility, working with Office on the services, working with our service detail. Uh, Sergeant Brooks does a great job with the men and women in that unit. Um, and we're basically spreading that out. Obviously, we talked, we talked about a area uh, where we're kind of looking at that sidewalk ordinances from Broad to 20th, Ludlow to Locust. That's where the uh, Center City Press Association say, hey, this is where. Our biggest problems are we're working on that next, and we're basically expanding it. Sometimes when you go too fast uh, in too short a time, we're not getting what we want to get done. But we're going to use Market Street East as a platform or just an idea. It does work for visibility, working with the businesses. We had an eyeglass shop that was we're about to close, but we you know we had a cop there probably twenty, it takes sixteen hours a day until we clear that corner by basically telling these folks. It's your presence here, what you're doing is not welcome. And that's important. Um, Whack-a-mole does work. Uh, unfortunately, when you move someone, then you might have to move them again. But after a while, they, they, they see that you know, Center City is not a safe haven to do, you know, I wouldn't call it lawlessness, but really, really bad street behavior. Uh, we met um, exclusively with a lot of big of the restaurant tours in the city in reference to the stuff that happens around the outside of the So we're combating that. We have a really good team. We put a great plan together with, you know, help of, of, of the chief and the captains and, and, the, and the blessing of the police commissioner to put a really, really good plan together. Um, and it's really focused on working with, you know, uh, with Jesse and, and, and Joe Ferrero on the other side of, of, of Broad Street, working with our community relations folks and putting the plan together. But, but this is a good start. We're, we're starting out. Uh, I'm, I'm very quick. We're starting off slow. I, I like to be faster, but by I would say by mid March, all these things that, that the commissioner spoke about will be in in place. The micro grids, and we'll be spreading out into Logan, uh, at Dennis, uh, without a doubt. Uh, individual you mentioned that um, what's it? Uh, the Asian yes, gentleman, yes, yes. He, King James. Yep, yep. He costs about eighty five thousand dollars a year in city services. That one person. And we've been there trying to deal with him for three years and he has to move. It costs a lot of money. But you know, there is the issue with, uh, they call it homelessness. There is a lot of different categories of folks that are sure. We do have some homeless. We have mental health issues. It's absolutely, most of the people you see on the street have mental health issues. I mean, it, it's it's severe. The issue is where do we put those folks? We have. We have street hustlers, we have hand handlers, we have people that are on drugs. Uh, we did miraculous work with the methadone clinic, which I have no idea why there is one on Market Street. We miraculous work there, working with the folks that own it and, and, and their behavior. So when someone says homeless, there's like four or five other categories with it. And mostly it's the mental health. If, if we could stop one problem with this administration, the next one is the, the issues around mental health, because a lot of folks that you see out there have severe severe mental health issues the guy 18th jfk they call him neighbor uh, big burly black guy with a beard nice as could be but he's there cold 
winter, summer, you'll see him there. And, and he'd feel bad. I talk to him a couple times a week, but he's not moved. And I've tried everything. I'll go get you on park. He's not moved. This if we could solve the issue around mental health issues, we would do a lot for the city. Inspector, where do you want us to contact? For That's a couple what I was of years, we were all told to call 911. It doesn't feel like a 911 issue, but you said to do it because it was for numbers and reporting. Sure. Will there be a new response place? What? How do you want I, I us to I think 911 is important, but when we set up those those microgrids, when we have those foot beats that started yesterday, we had training on Monday, started yesterday, I want you to call those footbeat officers. I want you to call that officer that handles that microgrid. Hey, I, I have an issue here because you may not think it's an issue with that person sleeping on that banner or on that little, you know, foyer of, of the business. But maybe if you have that direct contact, hey, I, I had this issue, and that cop is going to know that person because they know the area. There's ways, you know, working with Eric, uh, Eric, I'm sorry, Eric uh, Brooks from uh, service detail is working with getting that person in. Basically, getting the help the person needs, and, and it's actually important. We're trying to work with Office of Homeless Services, and we're really pushing them. Um, there's probably 10 to 15 folks in Center City, both Rittenhouse and Logan, that probably draw probably 85% of the services from homeless services and my service detail. I would really like to really focus on those 10 to 15 people that need the most treatment. I mean, they they're, they're sick. And what happens is, I think all those homeless services spread out too thin. Let's just focus on those 10, 15. Let's get them where they need to be. And I, I think we'll go a long way. But, you know, back to your question, uh, Rick, is, is once we have those micro grids set up, those footbeat officers, those PSA cars, you know, having that personal contact, calling Jesse, you know, calling uh, Sergeant Brooks, and he has 18 folks that work for him, and making those calls. But if it's something urgent, obviously, you're going to call my next question has to do with funding. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, whether the funding for the police is adequate, whether there's other people that should be doing what the police are asked to do, where more resources are needed, whether with more resources we could get more street patrols and people walking the beat, which feels good to us as a presence, as you talked about, and, and something that knows about the neighbors, whether there can be more bicycle policemen. The question, I guess, is how can we help you on the funding issues? Because between Logan Square and CCRA, we're relatively um, politically active. And a couple of our, um, our council members are listening into this conversation. What help do you want from us? And what do you need more that you don't have that we can help you do your job better? So thank you for that question. <laughs> I think we're starting to see the pendulum kind of swing a little bit more. We're coming out of the defund conversation or the defund narrative, um, but we're still waiting to see what that means. Here's why I say that. Uh, when I arrived here, because the pandemic was the pandemic literally within 30 days of my arrival, it was also budget time. And I was asked to identify budget cuts right off the bat. And as we went into 2021, I was asked yet again to identify areas where we could cut. Um, I don't think the in the second year was more so because of the pandemic and we were still dealing with the shock of it and what that meant. It, we were now kind of in a time where everyone agreed, including, and if you ask us, if you ask myself or my colleagues around the country, whether or not more services or whether or not more funding needed to go into social services, we'd all tell you, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Do we think that we should be responding to everything from A to Z? No, right, we're in agreement there. But I do not believe, and I said this when it was unpopular, and I'll continue to say it, uh, that the answer is to take money away from the police department. In 2021, we were being asked to do more we were asked uh, to utilize more equipment. We were asked to roll out additional training. And all the while people were saying, we want to see more cops on the street. All of that requires investment. All of that requires uh, investment in changing culture, changing culture from one that is uh, disciplinary to one that is now focused on performance, 
which means we're looking inward to determine what do we need to be the best of the best and to provide the services that we need. Again, it all costs money. And so it takes about, I would say, to get a full-fledged cop on the street, about a year and a half, because the academy itself is nine months. Then there's skilled training. this probationary period, right? So it takes some time. And so while I appreciate, I would never, ever look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> and say, no, we're good. Yes, we, we could always use funding, whether it's for equipment, for uh, community engagement, um, you name it. But in order to get even restore our authorized strength, that requires funding. But I think I just want to manage expectations because with conversations around, oh, we can give you some more money, it doesn't mean tomorrow you're going to see new cops on the street because of the amount of time that it takes to get someone trained, right? With that said, in the short term, in the interim, additional funding would help us with overtime uh, to help you know, pay for some of these operations or initiatives, you know, these, these details that we've been running. But we also have to think about burnout because we don't wanna utilize the same people over and over again uh, to do this. So yes, more funding is absolutely helpful. I would say if you wanted to utilize your bully pulpit, we would appreciate you saying publicly that yes, it's okay to publicly support law enforcement and to do so by encouraging uh, funding to give them the tools that they need to be successful. But it's also okay at the same time to hold us accountable. They're not mutually exclusive. You don't have reform by itself and you don't have all efforts into gun violence uh, prevention and reduction over here, they have to work together. So uh, again, yes, funding would help. Um, the ability to increase our authorized strength gives us the ability to hire additional people, which means as we hire additional people, we can put more people in the street. And I'm not taking from those specialized units to put them in patrol, leaving a void in those specialized units. And how about the reversing the negative effect of the residency rule? Is that something that you guys have identified as a problem and coming up to full strength? And would you like political assistance? To, because being full strength is something that we would like to support you on. <laughs> I need a mask for my eyeballs. <laughs> so I, when this question was uh, most recently asked, and I know there's a council member on the line, I saw you. We've been having some conversations about this. Um, you know, we're still kind of early on in knowing the impact. We just got a recent list uh, of 2,800 people with the residency requirement in place, but it's significantly less than the number that we would see on the list before. So usually we would see about 4,000 people on an eligibility list. This is 2,800. So we're starting with 28 people. If you can imagine a funnel right? We're going to weed people through this process. We used to have classes each time that we can pump out 100 people per class, no problem. But our last class started with about 40 or so people. People are, everybody's not going to make it, you know. I say, so look to your left, look to your right, somebody's, you know. So we're starting out with a smaller group of potential candidates that we don't know will make it all the way through the end. And then we also know that they don't always make it through the academy. Is fixing the residency, my preference would be, you know, obviously if we want to get more people uh, from the city, I think there may be some other creative ways to do that. Um, but whether or not this, so let me, let me just say this. I've spoken with the council president about this and he's very passionate about wanting to make sure that people within the city have an opportunity to get these good jobs. And I don't disagree by any means. Um, the understanding is that we can request a waiver. And the reason why I'm not giving you an answer answer is because it's so early. Um, we have requested waivers for two previous lists, which we got from civil service. I, I don't know if we'll continue to get these waivers moving forward. Um, if we see that the numbers are impacted so badly and we're not getting a waiver, I think that's when we ring the bell. Uh, but at this point, it's so early 
um, in the process. I can't give you an answer either way, but I don't want to wait until it's all doom and gloom either um, to wait till the last minute to say. Well, okay, you know where to find us, man. I'm doing I the bell. That. And the last thing I'll say before we go to the last topic is in dealing with businesses in the community, the national businesses, many of which are in Center City, CC, um, the uh, Target, and CVS are not responsive. I've talked to the managers and they're often not responsive in our efforts to help the police because many times it's their doorways that are being obstructed. If we, we know their landlords, we know who they are, they're members of our community, more probably in, in CCRA than Logan, but there are, there are national companies in both places. Would you find it helpful if we could organize a conversation with the owners, with the national offices to help them understand what this effort is and enlist their help? I heard a couple of days ago that uh, the manager of the CVS was hostile to an effort to clear a problem in front of his entrance that has been a consistent problem. That shouldn't happen. We know the people that own the building. We know those people. We can help if you, th if you guys think that bringing some of the national companies into the conversation would be a useful thing to do. Maybe that's for the inspector, I don't know, but that's something we could I, offer. I, that I believe work. that's always helpful, always helpful um, because it starts at the top. And so there could be some gaps or disconnect in communication, but I mean, at the national level, it needs to be made clear that these are, you know, safety and security are the priorities. And here's how we go about doing that in this individual city. Um, so you're, you're welcome to chime in, but yes, we can work together to organize that kind of I'll, conversation. I'll say something real quick. We, we've had, we have been in touch with a lot of the, the national folks, especially around the retail thefts. And, and that's, there's some, we're not talking about the, the kid that goes in and steals a candy bar. We're, we're speaking about the organized groups that are doing what they're doing. Um, you know, besides the issue with the DA's office and not charging some more lower end things, I think we have to look at it almost in a, in a civil manner where these targeted groups, there's almost like a stay away order from the CVS or the Target or the Wawa, where there's an actual civil judgment or like a, almost a PFA, where if you, you're deemed to commit so many crimes at this CVS or this Rite Aid, you're no longer allowed there. But again, it's, it's that corporate to back us up and say, I don't want this person in my store. They're not purchasing anything. They're, they're coming with a hockey bag and basically taking everything. So we're in the beginning uh, conversations with some of the bigs, the Target, CBS, Rite Aid. I spoke to Rite Aid uh, last week in reference to this, uh, and they're going to get a meeting of, of all the bigs in Center City. We just lost a business, uh, Broad and Chestnut, the Walgreens left. I'm not sure if it was because of a rental issue or something else. Um, but some of these you know, these chains are getting decimated in, in reference to, you know, uh, from these organized groups. So it's something to really concentrate on. It's, it's one of my things that I'm taking on myself, uh, part of the team is these organized groups and how can we work as a team? You know, the, 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 the crew that's going to Walgreens, they're also going to CVS, they're also going to Rite Aid. So it's working with that. And, and it's, it's it, you know, you may think it's a petty crime, but to the bottom line of these stores where their margins are thin to begin with, and it's important to make sure if you want help, if you want help from the community, we're standing by the different. Okay, okay. Thank you. Dennis, and I, last and I will second that in that I've, I've witnessed it. I mean, you know, the, the shoplifters coming out of the target across the street, drop the stuff in the bushes and head off to the right area around the corner. And they're, I mean, a corporate body that's a publicly traded company is only going to do that so long before they say, we have a fiduciary responsibility and we're pulling the plug. And that hurts all of us. I mean, it just is not good. So now we're going to go down in the weeds. Um, I mentioned that uh, we've got Harriet Williams from the Philadelphia and Eleanor Ingersoll here from Queen Village. Um, for over 10 years, the Philadelphians had to deal with the issue of behavior out by the art museum, specifically the Aikens Oval, the steps of the art museum. Um, Queen Village last spring organized a Zoom meeting to address the issue of dirt bikes, motorcycles, ATV, souped up cars. I think the number was about 2,000 people came in citywide. It's a city issue. We, we get it. We've had probably over a dozen meetings with council people, the police, and we're not, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. 
Um, so I need you to, I met, you mentioned yesterday in your, your very well done presentation to the Washington Post about Operation Pin Drop. I need a big pin dropped right on the steps of the <laughs> RDC. Um, these are illegal vehicles in that the mufflers have been altered. It's a motor vehicle code. Uh, I would suspect that if we went and checked uh, registrations, insurance, and all the other documents that we have to carry, you're not going to find them. But the behavior is also when 50 to 100 bikes, you know, are coming at you, it's overwhelming. But along the Ben Franklin Parkway, starting at 2601, the Philadelphian Parktown place down to the Phoenix, we've got thousands of residents who can't sleep. It's a health issue. And this is really taking quality of life and driving it down. Even last weekend, when the weather wasn't so great, still there were there, this, you know, this issue. But it's down in Queen Village. They have the extra benefit of the noise coming across the river from Camden, from music. Uh, but the Philadelphian has been championing this. You know, thousands of 911 calls in, and we just don't seem to be getting anywhere. So I guess my question is this. What's working in other cities? What can we put to play here? We, we take a bite out of this that, that not, you know, is something that's going to be taken up to Aramingo Avenue out to Winfield, around the city. How do we get something, and let's use the art museum as, as, the, as the starting point. All right, so this is an issue that's gonna, I take it personal, uh, and a lot of the deployment to be arrested actually comes out of my office. So everybody saw what happened to City Hall this year. Everybody knows what goes on in the parkway. And we put some things in place, okay? I know you mentioned, you know, illegal things on their vehicles and all a big part of the problem is the goal of it is to taunt us not to stop for us and we have policies we as, can't. as the police that's the police, mm -hmm. yes, the police so someone once suggested let's make a park for everybody to ride it that's not going to work because the thrill of it is scaring people and to one or my half of the city or mr half of the city that i have we try and run a, a car detail which covers three of my divisions but what we've been doing in center city and i actually brought he's one of the lieutenants that runs it all the time and we've been a little bit smaller on it recently because of the weather but we talked about it today we're going back full force again this weekend i don't want to give away numbers but we have a set package that just stays in center city for precisely for broad street for the parkway for the art museum we've gotten some help from the state police before because the parkway is actually and the river drive falls on the state police. We have gotten some help there, but we're gonna put our big package out again. And what we try and do is keep a movement. If we can stop an issue violation, we will. But I'm not gonna lie to you, a lot of times they just want us to chase them. That's the reality. So we're kind of like herding them out, so to speak, in groups, trying to keep it where it's most safe for the public. We don't have an easy solution for it. We've talked about, we've had many meetings and talking about different solutions. It's all over the country, and no one's come up with an easy solution. The, the slideshows, the nonsense we're going around, I mean, you've seen the videos. They're literally taunting our officers, they're driving around our officers, they're jumping on our cars. I took what happened in City Hall personally. It's out on my watch. That's never going to happen again in City Hall if I have to jump in a marked car and come down too. So I think moving forward, we're much more prepared every weekend. But like the commissioner said, we have a finite number of resources. Saving lives is our biggest priority. You don't have as much violence in Center City. I know sometimes we do because last night's job was ugly, but a lot of our deployment is in very violent areas in the city. But we are making enough changes where we can still keep things down in Center City to reduce it. I'm not gonna lie and say there's a simple solution because nobody's come up with a solution for it yet. Okay, I know sometimes you say, you know, we can't lock them in. There's legal issues with that. The speed bumps, all that would do would be make it more of a dark daredevil act for them to fly around Center City. I know that's been brought up. To make a park for them somewhere, that's a waste of money. I'm telling you, they're not going to do it. There's no fun in riding around without us chasing it or you're looking like, oh, my God, we're scaring us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the reality of it. So moving forward, you're going to see more of it. We didn't stop it for the whole winter. We just reduced it because of the weather. And when they're not coming into Center City to make you feel a little bit better, because of the issues with carjackings and the robberies, they have dual functions. When there are no ATVs and there are no dirt bikes to move out, 
their function is kind of fall in line with inspector, inspector, right? <laughs> Can't believe I did that. But their job is to fall in line with to supplement and enhance the plan he already has out there. So just give you an example: Friday, Saturday, Sundays. A lot of traffic in center states. I see it when I'm down here. I have a daughter who lives downtown. So we have a nightclub detail that's working all the main thoroughfares, going up street, Chestnut Street. When that car detail is working in Center City and we're not pushing these knuckleheads all over the place, their job is to be visible all the way from Spring Garden Street all the way down to South Street and all the way as far west as the York Museum area. And we have some areas that have to get hit with the carjackings. We focus on that as well. So I would lie to you if I told you I had an easy solution. But to tell you we're not going to stand by and do anything, not at all. We're going to put the resources out there and we're going to keep it moving. I know it's, it doesn't impact the quality of life, the noise, the craziness and all, but we're going to be out there. You'll see us out there a lot more moving forward. Hopefully everybody saw more of a presence going into the fall. I know I did one of the virtual meetings with the group from Spring Garden. And all. And you, if you did see in the other weather, we were having cars stationed right at the art museum with lights on. We're going to be going back to that with the weather down breaking hopefully a little bit. You know, I don't put it out there when we're having a blizzard, even though those daredevils ain't coming out in that room. Thank you. Thank you. We do see, you know, just one, I mean, in December there was an incident at 20, uh, on the, the circle where a car was bumped by a dirt biker. They followed him and, and they actually shot at him. I mean, this is, I mean, this is where it intersects with the entire issue of the guns and the violence. So it's, uh, it is a major, major concern across the city. But, you know, I will tell you, the Ben Franklin Parkway is, is one of the pivotal areas. We've spent an hour and it's been very productive. And the commissioner has agreed that she will take a few questions for a few minutes. I know that I see a sum in the, in the chat, but could you raise your hand so that we can quickly go through a couple of topics. Ben, and then Charles. I'm just going to stand up here so my back is uh, First of all, thank you for coming here. I was going to commit a crime for my wife's resolution for all police departments. I don't envy you the job that you have. I think it's, uh, it's really difficult and constantly evolving new problems to deal with. Having said that, I need to address a totally different subject. That is the uh, articles in the Inquirer this week about the Art and Love uh, situation and the, the clear abuse that so many officers are making of that system. And you were quoted in today's paper saying you were outraged by it, which is legitimate. But it sounds like you just learned it and you became outraged. So can you tell us a little more of the history of <coughs> how it has evolved to the epidemic proportions that it has, and what uh, can be done about it. So thank you. The, the question is about heart and lung and the number of officers that, that have been out. This has been a number that's been growing over time with some ebbs and some flows. Uh, heart and lung is a state law. It's not something that um, we as a police department implemented. Uh, there has been a number of officers. So I will tell you upon my arrival here, yes, I was aware of the number of officers uh, that were out. When we suspect, when we, the police department, suspect that uh, there's something pinky going on, we initiate an internal affairs investigation. We then present our findings to risk, risk management through the city uh, who oversees the uh, administrator for heart and lung, it's a, uh, an outside contract, a third party, they conduct an investigation. If they deem that there is fraud or uh, something out of the ordinary, then they refer to the district attorney's office or they cut the medical benefits. So we're kind of like the beginning of it, but we're not the final decision maker. Um, the very A very key component or stakeholder in this entire process are the doctors as well and we we the police department make our determined determinations as to whether or not someone can return to work based off of what the doctor is saying right so legally when someone brings back a note or and says well i can't do this because my doctor said here it says on the paper that's what we have to go by 
then when they're off for three years or two years and one day, you know, the, with three years coming, they are, they're miraculously healed and they want to promote, right? Legally, you don't get to utilize someone's medical condition against them for, um, you know, anyway, that would be considered an adverse employment uh, decision. All of that to say, so no, it's not new to me. It's not new to my predecessor or the police commissioner before that. And I think it's been made very clear that all of us have expressed outrage uh, in the process. And it's far more than just the police department as a stakeholder to make sure something gets done about it. Once it was uh, brought to my attention upon my arrival here, I used my opportunity uh, at the negotiations table um, this last time at the end of the year to try to do something about it within our realm of influence. What came of that was a change in the definition or the change in the language contractually of what is now eligible um, as an injury under a hardened law. So hopefully we haven't seen, it's too early to tell whether or not that's made any significant change, but I'm hoping that that will do something. You know, I don't get to be out for three years because I twisted my pinky, you know, going from here to the car. You know, it's made, been made very clear what types of injuries would now qualify for that. That's a step, but that's something that I was able to do within my, my area of influence. So yes, it's deplorable, but this has been ongoing for a very long time. And um, it's more than just us that would serve as a fix. Quite frankly, I think legislatively, piece of advice change the doctors they should not yeah. be employees of the fop because they have vested interests i've had another question here and another question there and then, and then okay people on the zoom can't could you speak really loud first i'd like to thank everyone i'd like to ask something specific for the You for that um so we do have most of my officers are already bike trained um and we do have a fund for it um as the officers come into the ninth district including myself um i try to make sure that they get the training most people most officers have the understanding that when they come to center city district riding the bike or walking on foot is probably going to be a part of their assignment um, the actual cost of it, um, is my community relations officer here, Jesse? Hey, Jesse. This is Officer O'Shea from um, the Life Community Relations Officer. <laughs> Where's the cost? Sorry to put you on the spot. Do so you? Yeah. Yeah. So we have um, Captain Ruben now, Inspector Ruben Lewis. Specifically, really great at getting those funds freed up that we have from clients here. Yes, so we have our PDAC has raised over 24 grand um, specifically for Center City, the ninth district, west side of Brooklyn. So we spent some of that money in repairs, um, new equipment for the officers to combat the cost of the bicycle equipment, which they have to come out of the pocket for essentially um, over the years. So we freed some of that money up. We've been successful with it. We still have about 18 grand, and that's without fundraising at all. What it costs for a single bicycle and an officer in a uniform to equip them fully, to equip them fully with the bicycle. Um, some of the bicycles are bought used, some of them are, are, are retreads from um, separate units. So it's tough to nail down a specific cost. I would say uniforms, a thousand uh, training, what, what, what that, the city incurs for that is, I'm not too sure. It, it's a, it's a leap. Is it one week or two weeks? It's Roughly two weeks. Depending on what time of year, it's weeks. roughly two weeks. Some of it's on the street, so you're getting that back. Um, so it, one week of training is expensive. 
expenditure for the officer would be off the street. That, that you have to take that into account. So I don't have a specific dollar figure, but it's not cheap. We do have a bit of funds in the ninth district for that. Um, I believe it's a manpower issue at this point. So if you guys run out, you know who to call because we care about that being taken care of. And the business community is very- <laughs> And the business community. So they're willing to step up. And right. that's how, I mean, right. Pauline, uh, that's what's happened with the PDAC, right? They, it's come from the, the neighborhood. We have so, time for one more uh, question. I, I think it was over here. Or no, 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 okay, sorry. David. Could you stand up and speak loud because the Zoom people have trouble hearing. Building-wise, compare against New York a lot. Here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I think it's it's not so cut and dry. I will tell you one of my pet peeves though, uh, just for basic officer safety and situational awareness, we, we, we're we used to having our head on a swivel. Um, and I want folks to be out and engaged and outside walking and outside of the car. But there's also going to be some times where they do need to be on their computers because that's that's their laptop. That's how we get details of calls and so on and so forth. Um, we have something that we have been piloting for uh, a little bit now called the Mobility Project. And that's through a grant um, funding from the Neubauer Foundation that's been pushing out cell phones. Uh, we have them in homicide now. Um, these foot beat officers, this is where the cell phones are coming from. The reason why this is important because at the palm of their hand, all of the things that we would have to go back either to the office and do or go back in our cars and do, we can now do on these cell phones to keep us outside of the car, keep us engaged. We can uh, connect with L and I right there on the spot, uh, identify new some, uh, nuisance properties, problem areas, whatever it is. So um, the answer is yes and no, in the sense that you know we're still a little bit behind technologically, but my priority and my preference is that we're out and about and we're engaged uh, for that very reason. I want to thank the entire Eleanor very briefly very because very because it, she's given us way over time. Thank you for, for inviting and thank you so much um, the entire support that you're here. Commissioner, I just want to say it was great to see you at National Man on Washington Avenue. It was great to see you at the Washington Post interview yesterday and tonight. And to, to echo you, that does uh, wonderful things for morale. Because morale here, Center City, down south of here, around around the general area, morale has been very low. Because there is a conversation, there are questions that make morale very low. So I, I just ask you, if I were to ask a couple of neighborhoods down south, if you would come and speak with us. <laughs> you got here first. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, because I really think it's the shot in the arm that everybody needs now to to get reinvigorated and reinvest in the community the charge that we're in this together. The answer to that is absolutely. Um, I don't think I've turned down a request yet. In all fairness, I think we have to remember that the city's just now reopening. Right. So a lot of the meetings that I've attended, they've all been virtually. A lot of my nice to meet you for the first time has been virtual. And it's just not that same. Right. So now that we have the ability to meet in person, we're starting to get out and engage and do more of that. So absolutely. Let me thank the commissioner, the captain, the inspectors, the chiefs. You guys were terrific to come and give your time. On behalf of both Logan Square and CCRA, we deeply appreciate it. And we Thank want you. you to come back after you see Eleanor. We want you to come back here too. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much.